Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for May 17th, 2022. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat feature, and I'll try to make sure Gail addresses them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature if you want to let us know that you're, you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. We're also streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you, you can share your questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. We're going to start, as usual, by talking about last week's tittle, which was called Routine Matters. The assignment was to consider a new or revamped maintenance habit. We'd love to hear from our participants who are live with us in Zoom and Facebook. Did anyone kick off a new habit or revisit an existing routine this week? Please let us know in the comments. We had several comments on this tittle. Mm -hmm. Um, On the subject of maintenance routines, Barbara on YouTube shared this comment. I stack clean laundry on my bed so that I have to put it away before I go to bed. Now, my take on that is we would spend a certain number of nights sleeping in a pile of clean laundry if we did that. (laughs) Because I'm not sure that would would create enough pressure (laughs) to make the next step happen. Right? What do you think? (laughs) I I love Barbara's suggestion because it would totally work for me. I would not be willing to climb into a bed that had laundry on it. And so I would pause and hang the laundry up that was on the bed. But (laughs) as Ed points out, um for some people clean clothes on the bed wouldn't be enough motivation Uh, they just shove them aside and get in the bed anyway i've seen a fair number of clients that treat their bed as just another flat surface that they can pile things on and they seed half their bed to storing stuff and to me that that's like the definition of interfering with my sleep that if there's half the bed where a body would be is full of full of things but i see lots of people that just sort of treat it like the, they sleep in half the bed and they treat the other half of the bed like a really big nightstand. <laughs> and so they just fill it up with what they're reading and their books and their clothes and whatever. And it's just a big old pile of stuff. And they're good with that. And it just makes me crazy, crazy, crazy when I see it. But some people are totally good with that. And so those of you that can be motivated by that trigger that Barbara uses, great. And if you can't be motivated like that, uh, well, and I'll tell one story. I had a client many years ago, um, a young man, he was in his early 20s, and he had sort of given up on doing the laundry. He'd gotten a little behind. He was sort of not really good at it. And so he would, when he would do laundry, he would pile it on the bed and then he would sleep on the bed. Like it got so full that he would sleep on the bed instead of laying in the bed the way that you would think with your head at the head and your feet at the feet he would sit on the bed and then fall back with his feet hanging off and sleep basically crossways on the bed and then he was wondering why he wasn't getting any good sleep (laughs) dude because you're not actually sleeping in the bed but it was a whole process for him to we had to clean out the closet cycle all the laundry hang up all the clothes and It was, it took a big effort to uncover the bed for him enough that he could actually sleep in it. And he did finally get there and he reported to me, oh, wow, sleeping, I'm sleeping really great now that I can get in the bed. Like, duh. (laughs) (laughs) It's just amazing what having a horizontal surface larger than your body will do for you. Right. Really incredible. And he was a really tall guy. He was like you, like he was six feet something. And so he would just like sit down and from his knees to his head, he would cover the entire bed and he was doing it at the sort of towards the head of the bed because all the clothes were at the bottom of the bed. <laughs> I was like, you cannot be sleeping well. He's like, yeah, I haven't really been sleeping very good. Like, Duh. Anyway, <laughs> that's my story of un- not uncovering the bed. But I also see lots of people who just like, they sleep on one side and the other side is just a nice big, long horizontal surface to them. And so they just use it to store stuff. 
Naomi and I would says, always feel like oh. it'd be sliding into me, right? Like you yeah. get in the bed and then everything sort of leans towards you. Right. But that doesn't bother some people. Naomi says half the bed is reserved for the cats who generally take their half in the middle. <laughs> right. <laughs> also, if we put our laundry on the bed, well, we do put our laundry, clean laundry is frequently on the guest bed. Yeah. And that is, as far as Hardy is concerned, an invitation to make a big, luxurious dog nest. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's nothing quite like, like a great big pile of clean laundry to make right? a dog You're nest. You're just making out a of. dog bed, right, Daddy? Like you meant that for me. Like I can't imagine what else it would be there for except for me to sleep on, right? Totally true. <laughs> yeah, cats are always trying to push us off the bed, just like they're trying to push glasses off the table all the time. Like you get in the bed and they're just always trying to shove you to the edge and off. <laughs> um cm on youtube had this to say about routines i noticed your shows are about one hour long so starting this week i'm going to listen to one of your older shows whenever i have a one hour maintenance chore like cleaning the whole bathroom or doing all the laundry or cleaning out the fridge or cleaning out the car i will let you know when i finish all of your programs your programs are always motivating and calming, and they keep me company during those boring maintenance tasks. <laughs> That's good. That's a ringing endorsement. We are less boring than her, her <laughs> than maintenance tasks. The bathroom. <laughs> 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 Thanks to Christine for that great endorsement of the channel's programming. <laughs> now, those were that was my, my assessment, not hers. Right, like, right, you know. right. But I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of our listeners actually say something similar, that, that, that playing a show in the background seems like you're not working on your dull chore alone. And truly, anything that will occupy your mind while you work has the same effect. You can play your favorite music, listen to an audio book, turn on a familiar TV show in the background, you know, the shows that you already know the plot, you know, the ending, and it's just like familiar fun to let them play in the background and you can walk past or listen to it with half of your head and still generally know what's going on on the show. Those can all provide some distraction while you work and a pleasant distraction can only improve the experience. So you might as well let us blather to you in the background or something else and uh, make it, a, have it be a little distracting while you do something that you find annoying. Um, Thanks, everybody. <laughs> M said, I talked myself out of the idea that doing dishes must involve a sink of warm, bubbly water. I'm keeping a small container of soapy water in the sink during the day to do the dishes immediately after I use them, telling myself that the dish doesn't get released from my hand until it is washed. At odd moments or at the end of the day, I have dry dishes in the drainer, which I can put away in a minute or two. It is a real lift to the spirits never to have dirty dishes in the kitchen. That's exactly, that's so, so wonderful to hear. Brilliant. And, and, and that's really, you know, that's the point we're trying to make about these, just these little things that if you can get a handle and develop a habit that works for you, that fits in with other things you do, it's so powerful. And then, you know, you never have a pot, a sink pile with dishes that, you know, is going to take you an hour to get to the bottom of, like you never have that ugly chore with dirty, smelly food. And, you know, I'm going to have to run the sink and be stand there for an hour to wash all this stuff or get it all in the dishwasher, whatever, or there's more than you can load in one round of dishwasher load. And that's all super annoying. And so if this process lets you do it with less pain and suffering. I love it. And that's a great win. Thanks for sharing it with us. That's a really good one. You know, I, I meant to add, and we just had, there was so much going on last week that I, that I didn't say this, but on the subject of washing dishes and the problem, you know, like the problem of getting enough, enough hot water and mm. all of that. Um, there was lots of commentary about that. You know, in the, and, and some good points made in YouTube comments as well about, you know, you don't, there are so many places nowadays where you where drought comes and goes and so you really don't want to waste water if you can possibly avoid it and you know Todd's house our friend Todd his house in Galveston had this great big wide I'm showing my hands but they go <laughs> off the screen great yeah. big wide double sink but it was very very shallow and so you couldn't run a sink full of hot water so he had tubs he had he had wash tubs and that really worked well 
as a way to conserve the water and, you know, keep the soapy water around and to, to you know, get as much use out of it as you could. And uh, so I had thought about mentioning that, but yeah, and lots of people Emma's talk about a, versions of that where yeah. you, they were saving the cold water in buckets and letting it, you know, off gas any chlorine overnight and then watering the plants or using that water for something else in in your process of cooking or it, so there was a lot of save the water, use it somewhere else and don't just let it run down the drain while you're waiting for the hot water to show up. And what a great idea. It was really, everybody had a lot of experience with that. There, you were not the only one suffering with this problem and lots of people yeah. had ideas. So um, go back and look and see what everybody else suggested. Jane said a dent was made. All the purchases accumulated on a table have been put away and no new ones have accumulated there. Woo -woo! That's a good <laughs> one. That is a very good one because lots of people go shopping and for them, the shopping trip stops when the bag comes in the house. And that is not actually when it stops. It stops when you put it away. So congratulations on closing that loop. That's awesome. Connie said, I managed five out of seven nights to tidy up the living room in addition to kitchen before going to bed. Ooh. Excellent. I hope that felt good. That must have felt like something when you came in the next morning and the kitchen was clean, the living room was clean. That's awesome. And Susie said, I am messy, but I don't leave anything on my bed when I go to sleep. I would put it all on the floor. And that's a, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, that's why your habit has to be a good fit for the rest of your style of living. Because if you have, you know, no patience for stuff on the bed and your default then is shove it off onto the floor, you are not ahead of where you started. <laughs> <laughs> you at least are maintaining your ability to sleep, which is an important thing. But yeah, you you just relocated the problem. Yeah. So Barbara says. Work on. Barbara says I was going to attempt to clean my desk, clear my desk again, but wanting a success, I cleared off the kitchen counter and kept it clear for the past three days. A start. Yay! And that's the experience that you want to have. Like I can, I can stay ahead of it. Once it starts out clean, I can stay ahead of it if I keep going back to it regularly in short bursts instead of leaving it and ignoring it until I have to spend five hours cleaning it off. Because then you just resent the hell out of those five hours. And so five minutes here, five minutes there, much less annoying, much less, it feels much less like you're giving away your life to the clutter if you are um, breaking it off in little bitty bites. Susan said, I went from a sinus infection in, uh, I think she maybe meant into COVID, so I didn't get much done. So sorry to hear that, Susan, Ooh, and we hope yeah. you're recovering quickly. But I did realize that having someone come help me clean is a good forcing function to get me to deal with my clutter. My <laughs> ex-husband and I used to have her come every two to three weeks. Now that I'm divorced, I'm only having her come every two months. So A, I would ask the first question, is two months often enough? Do you need, do you really need her once a month to stay ahead? And if that's true, then think of the money that you're spending for her to be there as part of your self-care. If having that person help you do some regular basic chores allows you to turn your attention to something else, things that you don't want her making decisions about, you know, clutter wrangling that all she can really do is pile up or stack up for you to deal with later. Um, it allows you to go and make some uh, judgment calls about what needs to stay and what needs to go and throwing things out and donating things away that you don't need to keep. And then she has to stop. Then she can stop moving that stuff around. So uh, you might consider if every two months is often enough or if you need a little bit more help. Having someone share the uh, load is always helpful. Okay, one more comment and then we should get to our, our main topic. Okay. Samudra, Samudra said, I recognized my tendency to collapse before a task is done physically, not so much emotionally. Right. So I stopped in time to clean up a little after the job. Baby steps. Recognition is the first step of change. That is so right. And that is a perfect example of figuring out what kind of physical stamina you have, how long you're good for in one sitting, and then don't expect to tackle the project and get it to done 
just expect to tackle the project for the hour or the two hours that you can stay on it. And then you need to have a break and maybe you need to plan. I work for, I've got two hours of stamina. So I work for an hour. I take a 15 or 30 minute break. I work for another hour. Maybe you can then take another 15 or 30 minute break and work another half an hour or something. You might be able to extend your capacity if you build in some breaks as part of the process as well, just to acknowledge that your physical capacity is not endless and boundless. Like when you were 20, Sure, we could all run rings around the room at, you know, for eight hours when we were 20, but that's not where we are now. So you got to accommodate your routines for your own physical capacity. Good job for figuring that out. Keep it up, Samudra. Good for you. The breaks are so important too. It took mm. me, you know, decades to work out that you can't just go and go and go and go and go. You, you have to let your brain do something completely different for a while nap, meditate, <laughs> read for pleasure, you know, not don't like, you know, take a break and, and browse Twitter while, you know, in between <laughs> tasks you're doing on your computer, you know? Well, and I think that you can go and go and go and go, but the result is that you get more and more and more slow, stuck, inefficient, ineffective, overwhelmed. Like you just run out of steam. It's right. not you can keep forcing yourself to do something, but you're going to get much more diminishing returns the longer that you do that. And so right. acknowledging that your brain needs a rest, that's why the Pomodoro techniques works. That's why 25 minutes and five minutes, 25 minutes and five minutes makes a difference because you're giving yourself a five minute mental break before you go back into focusing again. And then and there should be even bigger breaks after a few mm -hmm. cycles of that mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. so that you can you know okay now i need a, i need a serious break i need a half an hour and then i need to go back to it and and it will it seems like it's inefficient or ineffective but it is really supporting you to get good quality work done for the time that you focus on it so it's important to keep and we're going to talk about that a little bit today Okay, let's get to that. I shouldn't start giving my presentation in no, the middle. No, don't, don't give it all away. <laughs> to those of us who struggle with clutter, it can feel as if time itself is our one insurmountable obstacle. As we work to declutter our lives and spaces, we have difficulty balancing and allocating our time, and there's never quite enough of it. <laughs> Today, we're going to discuss procrastination, estimating the time that big projects take, budgeting time for maintenance, and other areas where organizing intersects with our perception and management of time. Okay. Over the years, many of my clients have worried about getting, their pro getting started on their projects and feeling like they can't get started until they know how to do it without wasting any time at all. It feels very important to do it in the most efficient way possible. And until they determine that way, they don't want to start. And the downside of waiting until the exact right, most time efficient pathway to appear is that your project is not getting worked on at all. Sometimes this waiting period goes on for years. And frankly, then it looks like an, an excellent stalling tactic, a successful procrastination. I'd like to suggest instead that we can look at improving how we manage time related to organizing projects instead of aiming to be the most efficient. Remember the clutter fairy motto, something is better than nothing. And if we're both trying to get something done and trying to improve how much time it takes, we're making good progress. We're not all productivity experts and our personal projects are usually rearranging the closet or handling the household mail. So we can strive to improve the process and make it easier on ourselves without worrying about attaining the time management equivalent of light speed. We just want some process improvement, right? So let's first look at time through the lens of the frequency of use. The, per the perfect client example I have of this is from a kitchen that I once worked in where the family was struggling with the mother's illness. And there were all kinds of people coming in to help with the household chores in support of the family. And the mom was complaining that putting away the dishes from the dishwasher was a jumbled mess. Nothing was ending up in the same place and the kids couldn't get any dishes out for themselves. 
And when I went and looked in the cabinet that was directly above the dishwasher, the one that was closest, there was the sink right there, closest to the sink, where I expected to find the family's daily dishes. Instead, I found 12 place settings of wedding china. So that was why no one could figure out where to empty the dishwasher because all of the easily reached cabinets had fancy china in them. So the dishes that were not being used at all were in the best place for emptying the dishwasher and for the kids to take the dishes down themselves. These dishes were not in the place that went with their frequency of use. So we moved the not in use wedding china <laughs> to a very high out of the way cabinet. It was basically, you know, the cabinets over the fridge and all the ones up at the ceiling. We moved all that wedding china way up out of the way. She had two little boys that were like eight and 10 or something like nobody needed the wedding china out right now. And putting those daily dishes on those lower shelves instead so that everybody could get to them and it made washing the dishes and emptying the dishwasher work so much better. The boys could come and take dishes out of those lowest cabinets. They could reach them. And anybody that came in, any random volunteer that came in to work in the kitchen could stand at the dishwasher and open the first cabinet they could reach. And that was exactly where those dishes were supposed to be unloaded. And it made that process so much better for them. Now, who knows if that was the most efficient way to do everything, but putting the daily use dishes in the easiest access place where it was easy to take things out and easy things to put things up gave them back a bunch of time. And it gave them back the ability to find what they needed immediately, which again, instead of spending all your time looking for where's the dish or going and getting dad to get the dish down because the little boys couldn't reach him, all that time came back to them because we put the most frequently used stuff in the easiest access cabinet. So when you're doing that, that takeaway here is that you need to consider how often an item is used before you decide on its storage space. That prime real estate that's easily reached without any effort or hardly any effort should hold the items that are most frequently in use and the dry dock, the out of the way, hard to reach storage is way up above everybody's head, should house those things that come out much less often. If they're frequently handled things are accessed and stored faster and easier, your organizing has improved the time needed to use and maintain that space. And considering the time it takes to get out and put stuff up helps you organizing better. So it's a goal to design all of your spaces for frequency of use, what things you need to get to the most often. And if you can rearrange your spaces for that, you will be getting time back. Next, we can talk about the idea of budgeting time for routine maintenance, like we were talking about last week. This is a common place where people get hung up, especially after they've completed the big organizing, reorg, redo, reset project. We tend to make a big push to get the larger project done, and then once it's finished, we breathe a sigh of relief and we walk off. And then we make no further effort to keep it up once we're done. And then the clutter starts to pile up again, right? It's the first thing that happens until we're ready for the next big push to beat it back. So it's kind of like hacking your way through the jungle with a machete. <laughs> once you've made a path through the vines, the jungle starts to grow back. So the lesson to learn here about time is that once the big project is done, but you're not actually done, the next step is to plan some regular recurring time slots to maintain what's already been cleared up. And we did talk about that some last week, but this is the case where short repetitive bursts, like having the dishes be washed as you use them, it accomplishes an ongoing maintenance goal, just like the big block of time tackles the one time big project. Whether you work on routine maintenance once a day for half an hour or twice a week for an hour, or two hours on Saturday, assuming you work full time and you're at work all day, you have to add some kind of regular repetitive maintenance time into your weekly routines. Slotting that time in will keep you from losing any gains you've made on a big project. And it will also delay the time that you have to make a major reset happen. Everybody has to sometime go back in and refluff completely from where they started. But if you can delay the time between those, you gain some of your time back. And so doing that routine maintenance allows you to stall until you have to do a big reset later. 
The third time issue to discuss is how to manage time so you stay ahead of new clutter while you're dealing with old clutter. And I'm sure you can guess the best source of this problem is your mail and other paper. The mail comes every day. It's easy to fall behind. If you commit to trying to catch up, how can you keep from letting the new mail replace whatever you've cleared of the old mail? And the problem represents really two competing projects. One project is the time you need to process the current mail. That 15 minutes a day, we bring in the new mail and you have to do something with it. The other project is the time that you need to process the backlog, whatever sitting and waiting around that you've been ignoring for the last week, month, year. If you want to make headway, then you really have to schedule time for both. If you work for a half an hour on today's mail or 15 minutes or five minutes, depending on how big your mail stack is, then your backlog of mail stays the same. If you work for a half an hour on last year's mail, then your current mail replaces last year's mail that you process and you made a net zero effect. And that's not what you're aiming for. So the way to get ahead on the, an existing project is to work on the backlogged items and the current items both and allocate time to each of them every time you work. That means if it takes 15 minutes to handle today's mail, you also need to spend 15, 30, 45 minutes on older mail to have a net loss effect, to be getting ahead so that your overall mail pile is shrinking. The longer it takes to handle the current items coming in, the more you need to hit the old items to get ahead. Also, this is a case where if you can stay ahead of the current installment first, then the more time you devote after to the old stuff, the faster you'll get ahead of the old stuff. Not everyone has that much extra time they wanna give up. So ultimately in order to make slow and steady progress, you need to spend time on the current stuff, then some amount of time on the backlog. So you're steadily chipping away at the larger project all the time. Craig said, I'm so good at the projects, but not so good at the maintenance. It's a pattern I've been noticing over the past year or two. And I have increasingly been, been of the opinion that the maintenance routine to keep the backlog from growing is the more important thing if you have to choose. You know, mm -hmm. like I, it should be the first one, mm -hmm. I think. If you're going to allocate time, you know, certain amount of time every day or certain amount of time every week do the current stuff first because the stronger that that habit grows of keeping the the backlog keeping from ahead. getting worse the stronger that habit is the more the it's it, for one thing it'll get easier because habits that you do regularly get easier you get better at it you get faster at it it becomes less stressful absolutely and then that frees up a little time, a little energy to de devote to the backlog. Part of what you're describing here, Craig, is that I have clients who have to get in the mindset to focus and then they like focus in hard and they like beat at it for hours and make a huge amount of, of accomplishment. They make a lot of progress and then they want to walk away and not think about it for a while. And that works as long as you do that faster than you're making new stuff so if you don't do maintenance well like you don't do it weekly well or you know every day or every other day or something go to a bigger chunk of time like maybe you do instead of 15 minutes a day do two hours a week and let that be your maintenance so that you only do it once a week instead of having to do it every day if that allows you to focus in and you will sit down for a couple hours and maintain the current stuff by, I'm going to sit here for two hours, then maybe that will allow you to blend the two enough that you can have that maintenance be happening and then doing the other projects outside. I do recognize that some people do better when they focus in big, bigger chunks. And so work on the chunks that make it happen for you and how you know you're winning is are you staying ahead of the current stuff and are you dialing down the backlog and whatever combination of appointments that you make with yourself to make that happen is fine <laughs> like if it doesn't work for you every day and you can't 15 minutes or 30 minutes is too short of a focus period then 
go for every other day, go for twice a week, go for once a week, go for an hour, go for two hours at a time, and just make sure you still accomplish the same goal of, I got all the week's mail done on Saturday or Sunday and you get through it all and you make all your choices and you wipe it to zero and you have nothing left so that when the mail starts to come again, Monday, you're, you're ready with a new batch. And in the meantime, you can be scheduling your big project hits on the things that you focus down on. I have other clients, my client zeros are like that. Um, and he <laughs> particularly likes to, he hates doing the recycling. And so he will wait until the recycling is huge. And then he spends, you know, 90 minutes or two hours breaking down boxes, folding all the, pulling all the paper out, getting all the can, like he goes and gathers it all. And he spends all that time processing it. Now that makes me crazy, but it's how he does it. And so it's works for him because every week, a bunch of recycling goes out to the curb. Like he doesn't miss the recycling and he makes sure that he gets everything ready to go in term, in time for the, the pickup. So I don't live in his house, so I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and that process works for him. And the only place where it's a problem is that <clears throat> if they're accumulating it faster, then he can break it down in a big focus session. Then I think it, um, it becomes necessary. How he could improve that process for himself would be, if he could recognize that the volume of recycling ha is growing larger because they've had so many more packages than normal, or there's, the, you know, they opened a bunch of cans in, in unusual volume, or there was a whole bunch of mail that came that got thrown out. Like if he, they, he can notice that his volume is bigger than normal, then he could maybe spend an hour at it in the middle of the process, I mean, in the middle of the time frame, and then spend his typical, you know, 90 minutes or two hours at the end to be able to still put it all out in time and get to the end. So that requires some judgment of the piles getting bigger than I can handle in the two hours I'm going to do later. So I need to at, tack in another hour somewhere else. You can do that too. And, um, and see if you can stay on top of some of that maintenance stuff just make it, um, you know, a slightly, <laughs> a slightly um, uh, less frequent tackling of the maintenance instead of the 15 minutes or the once a day that we advocate most of the time. It won't work for everybody. You can modify. Before you get back to the, the presentation, I want to shout out to Linda, who's with us on Facebook. She says, so glad to catch you this week. I have a good example of how not to expedite decluttering. My house burned three weeks ago and the last three weeks have been decluttering on steroids. Oh, Linda, our hearts go out oh, to you. No. Oh, no. Sorry. Oh. oh, what a terrible thing to have to deal with. Well, and you know, that process is going to be super traumatic for you. The, I'm sure the experience of having it burn was very traumatic mm. and there is a, a massive workload and dirt load and, toxic chemicals you're having to deal with and it's going to be an ugly ugly project so just try to take care of yourself in this process and don't let this be a permanent scar for you not all projects in a new and repaired home are going to be like this burn process sometimes losing a bunch of stuff at once triggers people to hold on to and grab things but instead think of it as, you know, we laughed when people, when Harvey flooded um, in Houston, lots of people were decluttered by Harvey. <laughs> they had their garage cleaned out because, or their house cleaned out because Harvey came and made everything wet. And so it all had to go to the curb. So um, just think of it as uh, nature's way of helping you declutter the house. <laughs> and maybe, um, you know, you'll have a fresh new space when uh, the repairs are done. And you'll um, love your less um, your lesser volume contents, and it will be a wonderful new space for you on the other end. I'm so sorry. What a suffering project. We'll think of you. Keep us up to date on how it's going. Okay, so I was talking about two competing projects, the current stuff and the backlog stuff, and how to get ahead on that. Um, We've gone through that. Okay, so another time perception problem we have is in the way that we estimate how long a project's going to take. 
I call this clean time blindness and anybody that neglects the space for a decade and then thinks it can be straightened up in a weekend is shocked to find out <laughs> that that weekend that you're estimating is really that's how long you're willing to work on the cleanup, not how long it's actually going to take. And all I can say to you is you wish it was only going to take a weekend. A large decluttering job takes what it takes and you'll find lots of hidden time sucks in the project. Of course, you can't commit to one long nonstop push to get through the whole project. So pretending that kind of push will win the day is just fooling yourself. When you're estimating how long a big project will take, you're better off estimating how long you're willing to work in one particular sitting and how, will, how, how to repeat that for more than one day. That way you can decide how much time you're prepared to put into a project each day. And then you can repeat that day as frequently as possible until the project's done, however long that is. If your project's going to take longer than your ability to focus and stay on your feet, then you only need to worry about your preferred working time slot instead, how long you're willing to work in one sitting. You're going to have to repeat that time slot for as many days as it takes to get all the way through. My client theme right now is estate clear outs. I have one client that's downsizing to a new place. And so she's trying to clear out of the townhouse that she's lived in for many years, probably more than two decades, I think and two clients that are clearing out their parents' houses. All of these clients thought they could get it done in four or five weeks, except that one client is fairly immobile. Another client had her foot in a walking cast at the time that she started the job. And the third client and her husband work full time and have a toddler. So no one has the time or capacity to devote the full-time attention that would be required to get those projects done in a month. For all of these people, the projects are going into and past their first year. We're working on it as much as they're willing to work on it at the speed that they're willing to go. And it takes the same amount of time, whether you do it in small bites or you string it all together at once. So schedule what you're willing to do as frequently as you can do it and then repeat until your project's complete. And forget the judgment about how long it takes. There's no prize to win at the end if you can empty your parents' house in a hurry versus emptying it over the course of a year. Just saying. The last obstacle about time is to discuss procrastination. All of our, um, you know, Achilles heels. If we had the magic bullet to overcome procrastination, we'd all be super rich. Uh, we avoid what we don't wish to face and whatever doesn't feel like a rewarding experience or whatever seems overwhelming or frightening or beyond our capabilities. While I'm not an expert at this, I've learned from experience you can climb over fear or overwhelm or boredom with a very few steps. You don't have to see how it all will get done. You just have to be willing to take one small step towards the process. My favorite illustration of this was a story that I read once about a woman who needed to start exercising for weight management and health issues and she'd never exercised before, so she told herself each day she'd walk one more step than the day before, and then she'd stop for the day. So she started with one step out the front door and then went back in the house. The next day, she did two steps and went back in the house. The next day, three, and then four, and then five, and so on, until suddenly she was at the end of the driveway. That process took several days. Eventually, her one more step each day got her really walking far far more than she could ever have imagined, but she started in the slowest way possible with one more step each day. You can apply that principle to whatever you're procrastinating about. Start now and do one thing towards your goal. If that's all you got, then stop there and promise to do another tomorrow. If you can do one and add another step before you stop, great. But you only have to add one more step in the process to be in motion about that project. Of course, the more steps you can do in one sitting, the faster you get to your goal. But even one step is progress, however slow that progress is. That's my comments today about time and organizing. And so I'm um, anxious to hear what you guys are struggling with around time and time management and time <laughs> estimating and et cetera, et cetera. Well, we also have a couple of uh, 
other comments I didn't get to on the the previous topic, and I want okay. to find Anya shared. Thanks for last week's advice. I love the project folders, and thanks to Rowan for is this worth my time. I managed to getting rid of books after debunking lost cost fallacy and the idea I couldn't get rid of meaningful books, though I did not wish to read them. All <laughs> gone now, sold and or donated. That that is so great. Yay! That is so hard. I you know, as someone who is just completely addicted to books, I I I totally get it. The idea of you know, the pain and suffering of giving here's, up a book. Here's this book. I spent money on this. I <laughs> want it. I, at some point, I was re I really liked the idea of reading this book, and I, I've not never gotten to it. I'm probably not going to get to it because I have, you know, the my my interests have moved somewhere else, or I've got the list of fifty other books that have moved ahead of this one on the list. I really feel that. Right. But congratulations on getting there and uh, making some choices and feeling like you accomplished some movement. That is really wonderful. Good job. On the topic of time, Holly said, new thing, new thing. I do 30 minutes of decluttering daily. I used to have the thought that's not going to help or get me to my goal. And we've said this before, but it definitely bears repeating people routinely underestimate how much you can accomplish five minutes at a time, 10 minutes at a time. If you stick with it, you know, whatever, whatever your threshold is, if you stick with it and turn it into a really reliable habit, you will see progress. You will see big, significant prog progress a, a few weeks down the road, a few months down the road, you know, whatever your struggling against it may, you know it could take a while but you will get there and don't forget to take pictures when you start because when you are sitting there going oh I've, you know i've only done a half an hour and it doesn't look any different if you go and stand there with your picture next to what in front of what you are looking at currently you'll realize exactly what's different because we clear space and then you're looking at negative space versus your memory of it and it doesn't you don't remember that that space was completely full before so um, make sure you have some evidence to show to your lying mind <laughs> that you actually have made a difference and you actually are accumulating um, accomplishment as you go along every week. It's a great way to prove it to yourself. Keep even those in five minutes a day. Yeah. And keep those checked off lists of things you did. You, you know, you don't, don't keep them forever, but keep them for a little while so that and stacking up on your clipboard or piling up the pages in your notebook where you keep track of what you're accomplishing. You got something done. Well, it's, and remember we talked about that whole, you know, make, keep a list of how many bags of trash you take out or, or how many bags of donation you make so that if you ever start to feel I'm not doing it well enough, I'm not doing enough work, I'm not accomplishing enough. You can go back and look. Yeah. Except that paper. I've taken 35 <laughs> bags of donation out. Like, that's a big when you start looking at that cumulative number of stuff that's left the house you're like oh my god where did those 35 bags of things go in the house i can't imagine where they would be now and yet they were in the house somewhere at some point so it's a good reminder for you to you know keep a track of how you're doing it how much you're doing so that you can always in a low moment go and prove to yourself that you really have done a lot Sometimes when you take stuff out, the other stuff sort of like relaxes and spreads itself out more. So it seems like you have, you still have more stuff than you really do. Right. It's like the pudding fills the bowl. Right. <laughs> it spreads out. Bella asked, <laughs> Bella asked any packing tips for moving in a U-Haul U-Box across country. And I shared a link to our playlist on packing, moving, and unpacking. I hope mm -hmm. that that's helpful. Are you familiar with the U-Haul U-Box? Is it's like a pod, like a pod? Yeah, it's like a pod thing. So that they park it and you fill it up, and then off it goes. And um, well, several people mentioned, um, you know, take careful measurements and uh, sturdy plastic totes, um, which you know totes or or boxes of uniform size that mm -hmm. stack very neatly so to make it well. easy to 
make sure that you're fitting your, your space requirement. And do not, do not, do not put a stack of small boxes on the bottom and a bunch of big boxes in on top <laughs> of it. No, no, no. If that box is hanging out over open air, you know it's something's going to go wrong. You just cannot do that. You are not creating a Zynga tower. <laughs> you want it all to be very stable. You want it all to not move around inside the truck. And the only way you can do that is to make sure that it's a pyramid, not a funnel inside that truck. So it doesn't need to be swiveling. Those towers need to be uniform and stable. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and, don't, and, uh, don't put the light stuff at the bottom. You want all the heavy stuff on the bottom, the light stuff on the top. She mentioned um, they used tape on the floor to lay out the size of the box. That that's a great, that's a fantastic yeah, idea. That's a good idea to, to model the box inside the house and start staging the stuff there to see cool. how you're doing. And and from that, they made the decision not to take their sofa love sofa slash love seat. Woohoo! One less thing to move across the country. That's awesome. Irene asked, what do you do if your spouse keeps telling you to tidy up or makes you feel like you must tidy up and you're sick of it? We have seven kids. Er... I guess getting rid of some of the kids is not really an option. Getting rid of the husband <laughs> might be an option. Just saying. That okay, is... so um, that is a negotiation yeah. tactic, right? And I think it is important for, um, you know, the person that thinks you should be tidying up lives in the house too. He's a viable adult that lives in the house and you guys need to be doing that as a team. So it's not just your job. And um, if he's going to work and you are staying home with seven children, y'all are both working all day. <laughs> so don't let anybody tell you you're not because you know absolutely that you are. So um, the whole keep the house clean is a joint project and brother man needs to get on board with that. It's not the 1900s. He doesn't get to go to work and smoke cigars and come home and be fed and sit on his mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, and do nothing. There's way too much for everybody to do. And it all needs um, dual support of all the viable adults in the house. And that might include you know, some children that are, you know, teenagers, young adult people that want to have their part of the process as well. Well, even, even preteens can, mm -hmm. can, can do some very useful work exactly. if they're properly guided. <laughs> properly guided. Well, and that's the thing. It's like when there's eight people or nine people in the house, everybody's participating in that living space. And no matter how young or old you are, you can all do something towards, you know, that is age appropriate towards you know maintaining the space that everyone shares it is not just mama's job and don't let him tell you that because i'm gonna smack him yeah <laughs> nothing makes me angrier like you're grown up disclaimer grown up. disclaimer the clutter fairy does not advocate violence in any form <laughs> right <laughs> but it is absolutely something that everybody you know we all live in the house. We all share in the maintenance and care of the house. If we all want the house to be nice, we all have to participate in the house being nice. That's the deal. Well, and that actually is a great place to talk about next week. Oh, okay. Because our topic, there are many ways in which clutter keeps us from living the lives we want. And an effective way to assess the present state of our homes is through the lens of peace of mind. Is there stuff in your space that stands in the way of your feeling rested, relaxed, and serene, or of other people in your home feeling that way? In our next episode, we're going to offer suggestions for clearing the worst trouble spots, opening constructive conversations with the people who share your space, and moving toward a more peaceful environment. Join us next week, uh, Tuesday, May 24th at noon U.S. Central Time for a space of one's own organizing for peace of mind. Naomi says, my problem is too much time. Being retired and having a whole day available, I think, oh, no problem. I can do it later. I'll just watch one YouTube video first. And it ends badly day after day. And then you and waste the whole day is what you're saying, entertaining yourself and not ever actually get anything done. Well, and as a self-employed person who had to spend the first several years of self-employment figuring out how the heck you, you know, keep yourself going when no one else is 
nagging you to do your job. Um, I think, you know, think, think about what you want your job in retirement to be is, you know, if you're, if you want to make a job of making your space more attractive, comfortable, relaxing, et cetera, which I'm assuming you do because you're here in this meeting. Yeah. Cause you came to listen to us. Right. Um, then figure out how long do you have to be at that job and show up for that job? Right. Yeah. Yes. And I think that this is a, this is a common issue for people who retire in that they struggle to shift from the go to work routine to the being at completely at my own discretion routine. And it, that lack of structure um, sort of stops everything from happening because they're used to, if I don't show up at eight o'clock or nine o'clock at the job, I get fired and then I can't eat. And so you have a very negative um, n- motivation to keep a schedule for work when you have to go to work every day. But when you're set on your own with nothing specific to do, then um, you it is part of the adjustment to retirement that you make a schedule that works for you. And so if you're a morning person, maybe you set the alarm, you make sure that you get up and take a shower, you plan to work for an hour or two hours while your energy is really great. And you take your relaxation time in the afternoon. If you're a night owl, maybe do that in reverse. Now you don't have to get up at seven o'clock because you don't have to go to work. And so maybe you get to sleep in until nine and then you get to get up and have coffee for an hour and you don't do anything until after lunch. Well, that's great. Just create your schedule and that motivates you to get up and get going every day and make it work for you. You don't have to spend your whole, you don't have to spend eight hours a day or 10 hours a day or six hours a day working. You don't have to replace your job, but you do have to create a schedule that makes you, um, that gets you willing to be in motion and get some things done that you find valuable and important. And so relying on yourself to suddenly while you're sitting on the couch, looking at the television to go, oh, I feel motivated to clean today. Like that moment doesn't ever happen. You know, it doesn't happen. (laughs) That's just wishful thinking sister. So um, deciding while you're not looking at the television, I would like to make headway on this project or I would like to do my maintenance routines or I wanna make sure I'm cleaning the house or I wanna work on the backlog project or I wanna clean out the closet or whatever you're gonna do make a schedule for it and keep it and set alarms around it. If you're going to start working at one o'clock in the afternoon, then you should set an alarm that goes off at one o'clock somewhere in the house. And you have to get up from wherever you're sitting and go turn it off. (laughs) So you get yourself in motion that way. Um, It's just a matter the the joy of retirement and the challenge of retirement is creating your own schedule that works for you. Instead of, you know, when you were working, you kept somebody else's schedule and you did what they wanted you to do when they wanted you to do it. And nobody likes it, but you do it so you can eat. Well, when you get retired, then you get to do what you want. And what you want also includes improving and maintaining your space so that you're happy in it. And so making a schedule around that, that works for you is the thing to do. And good luck with that. Okay, we better get to the tittle. Okay, so this week's tittle is make the time. Our assignment this week is to evaluate. You want to evaluate your your recurring commitment of time towards either routine decluttering maintenance or longer-term organizing projects. Reflect on how much time you typically spend in the average week or whatever time frame makes the most sense to you on your organizing efforts. On which days and at what times do you usually do the work? Ask yourself, am I moving steadily towards my goals? If the time you spend feels manageable and appropriate and you're reaching your targets, then you're on track. So your tittle assignment is done. (laughs) But if you feel like you're falling short on your organizing objectives, consider how much more time you'd be willing and able to commit. It's okay to aim high, but don't shoot for the moon. If you're spending a half an hour a week, try for an hour a week instead. Schedule a recurring appointment for yourself to work on either routine decluttering or long-term project, or make an appointment for each one if you're feeling ambitious, a routine hour and a long-term project hour, like we talked about in the mail earlier today. 
put the appointment into your day planner, your calendar app, or whatever system you use for critical events, schedule your appointments for the next three or four weeks. So think of what it takes for you to get to the dentist. You set a dentist appointment or a doctor's appointment. You know, those are like etched in gold because if you miss them, you have to wait another three months to get in, right? So you can't miss it. So whatever process you use to capture those that, that dental appointment and not miss it, that's what you should do with these decluttering appointments. Track them in the way that makes you honor it, value it, not miss it. Put them in that system. And that's how you schedule them and schedule it for three or four weeks of, of work going forward. Now, here's the hard part. Hold yourself accountable. Show up, ready to work at the designated time. Keep your notes or photos, like we said, to document your accomplishments. And when you've completed all the dates that you've scheduled, revisit the plan, reevaluate, like we, like we talked about earlier in the tittle, is the amount of time that you're spending helping you reach your goals? Are you getting there? Is this a good enough, is this a good enough time? If it is great, you've got a permanent plan and schedule another round of appointments. If it's not, then adjust the plan. I need more time. I, instead of an hour, I need to do 90 minutes or two hours, whatever you need to do, and then schedule those instead. And just keep repeating. Now, the reason I don't say schedule to the end of the year is because you know things are going on with your life. You're going on vacation. Your family's going to show up. You're going to go to some party. Something's going to happen. So you can sort of look out for three or four weeks and see yeah, generally, I know that this time is free and I don't have anything coming down the pike that I don't, um, that I'm not prepared for. And so I can schedule three or four weeks of appointments and have a pretty um, high likelihood of being able to do them and not be interrupted or having them be bumped. And so that's why we say don't schedule it until kingdom come. Work on three or four weeks worth of the schedule and see how it goes. And then reevaluate when you run out of appointments and do it again. Okay, I want to make an announcement that we don't manage to get to often enough, which is about virtual organizing. Oh, okay. We haven't mentioned that in quite a while, but if you are, obviously, if you're in the Houston area, in Gail's service area, you could work with Gail one-on-one -on -one in person. But even if you're not, from anywhere in the world, if you have an internet connection, you could work with Gail virtually. If you're interested in checking that out, visit cfhou.com slash virtual. Click virtual organizing session. You're going to see our scheduling app and you can click virtual organizing session to see a list of available time slots. Please don't it's click- It's important to pick that one because- Yeah, don't click free assessment because that only applies to in-person appointments in the Houston area and not virtual organizing sessions. And the virtual one, um, when you pick that one, it automatically schedules the Zoom appointment and yeah. free assessment does not. So- you won't get a Zoom appointment if you don't pick the right one. Right. And one of the benefits of virtual is Gail records the whole thing so that you can, you don't have to, you know, necessarily take notes. You can just walk and talk your way through the appointment and then Gail will share a recording with you so that you can revisit it as many times as you need. Okay. If you are watching this on YouTube, we would love for you to join us live to get notifications about upcoming events we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. Meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook. I'm all about the pink today, huh? Right. Or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We are a little heavy on pink. <laughs> we love to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and topic suggestions on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere else that you find us. And you can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks, everybody, for coming today. Have we covered everything? Okay. We will see you next week, and we can't wait till you're back again. See you bye soon. Bye-bye. Bye.